and welcome back! Today, we take a look at Black Mirror's second episode, 15 Million Merits. If you haven't seen our first video on Black Mirror's first episode, The National Anthem, click here. For everyone else, let's dive into Black Mirror's second episode, 15 Million Merits. Unlike the first episode, 15 Million Merits takes place in a dystopian society. We follow the story of a man named Bing. He, like everyone else, lives in a box with screens for walls, and earns merits, which is pretty much money, by riding a bike which supposedly powers their society. If you are physically unable to ride the bike, you become a lemon. Lemons are pretty much the scum of the society, they pretty much function as janitors. They're so hated that there's even a video game about killing them. Most people spend their time staring at screens as they ride their bikes endlessly. You could either watch your doppel ride a bike endlessly, or you could watch the TV programs in offer. Like, Father God. Is that what it's called? Father God! Yeah, that. Then there's Hot Shots. It's an American Idol type show and is the most prominent show in the episode because it's the only way to get off the bike. Then there's porn. It's just porn. Yeah. One of the things I love about the episode and the show as a whole is that there's no obvious exposition dump. As an example, let's look at this line. Almost the only real thing in there and even that's grown in a petri dish. With just this line, we can assume that the world outside cannot sustain life, is apocalyptic, or has other such annoyances. It does this without the episode having to directly say that something went horribly wrong in the past. Unlike the first episode, 15 Million Merits has plenty of music throughout. Not only that, but music plays a pretty big role in the episode as well. There's I Have a Dream, a painfully generic song, which I assume was made specifically for the episode to be as generic as pop- And it's real. <laughs> okay then. Okay, uh, turns out. <laughs> Um, I Have a Dream is made by a Swedish band called ABBA. Since its inception in 1979, there's been like a shit ton of covers of it, for some reason. I had a dream, a song to see. This song is perfect for the episode because of its genericness. This is the type of society that idolizes and encourages laziness and plainness and boringness. So it makes a lot of sense that this would be a hit to this type of society. No clue why it was a hit in ours though. Now let's talk about, you know, the, the actual plot. If you take it literally, like I did, we see the story of a failed rebellion. If Bing stood his ground and hadn't pussied out, his rant slash speech could have sparked some sort of revolution. Or maybe not. Before we can go any further, let's actually talk about the speech itself. Bing gives this amazing speech about everything that's wrong with their society. In it, he points out all of its flaws slash bullshit. To me, there are three things that make this scene just work. First, Daniel Kaluuya's acting. It's really fucking good. Like, 
this dude is screaming, sweating, spitting and shit, and it just feels so real, so, so genuine. You really believe that this is a guy who is finally releasing all of his pent-up anger towards the world after god knows how long. Second, the audience's reaction. At first, the audience has no idea how to react to this. Which makes sense because they've never seen anything like it. Real human emotion, not, not the fakeness that they're used to. They don't react at all until the judge pretty much tells them how to react. That was, without a doubt, the most heartfelt thing I've seen on this stage since Hotshot began! <laughs> Thirdly, Bing's decision to become the very thing he hated. It's just fucked up. Like, the show even went out of its way to make it even more fucked up by adding the carton box subplot. Bing went out of his way to not drink it so that he wouldn't be drugged into making a shitty decision like Abby was. And in the end, even though he didn't drink it, he still ends up being peer pressured into selling his soul and becoming a massive hypocrite. As I was saying, his speech could have been ignored completely or tossed aside as the ramblings of some crazy person. The fact that they didn't react until the judge told them to tells me that these people are pretty much, as the synopsis calls them, slaves. Originally, when I read the synopsis, I disagreed with calling these people slaves because they weren't treated poorly or had like shackles on their ankles or such. The addition of televisions, doppels, lemons, etc. is there just to artificially create a sort of regular society. I think all that is just there to mask the fact that they're slaves, just not in the traditional way. Which makes me think that even if Bing didn't sell out, maybe there wouldn't be a revolution like I thought. Mostly because these people are completely oblivious to the fact that they're slaves. While I'm sure there are a few here and there who share Bing's ideals, the majority are completely fine with their way of life. Now, let's talk about the episode's best scene in my opinion, Bing's Breakdown. Earlier in the episode, we are shown ads for the porn program I mentioned earlier. They constantly pop up in the episode, interrupting Bing in whatever he was doing at the time. If you try to ignore it, an alarm will trigger and won't stop unless you watch the ad to its entirety. However, they can be skipped. For a fee. At this point in the story, Bing doesn't have enough money to pay the fee, so he's forced to watch the ad. These ads are nothing new, they've popped up two times before. What makes this one different is that this one features Abby. Okay, let's start from the beginning. After what happened in Hotshot, Bing stopped caring about anything and just... gave up. This changes after this scene, in which he is forced to face his fear. He is forced to watch what the woman he loved had become. Forced to see what her dream had become, and, and to see what in his mind was partially his fault. One of the reasons this scene is so effective is for its use of reincorporation. The episode has a few of them, but this is by far the best one. As I said earlier, the episode shows the ad two times before, so by the third time it shows up, we kind of know what to expect. Because of this, our expectations get broken, which gives the scene a lot more impact, and is what the scene is going for. Shock, disturbance, and surprise. Furthermore, we know that Bing couldn't escape because the episode took its time to explain how everything worked. Obviously, the scene wouldn't work if we didn't know about the alarm system or the ad skipping fee beforehand. Also, you gotta admire the little details in the scene. Like how at first the ad is only playing on one screen, but after Bing activates the alarm, the ad is now playing on all of the screens. Which is pretty fucked up. And speaking of fucked up, the ad itself is also really fucked up. Like, Judge Black Guy forces Abby to sing her song while having sex with her. 
That small little fucked up touch makes this scene even more disturbing. It's like, this set is mocking anyone who tries to dream, who, who wishes for something more, for something better than the fucking bike. I was in complete shock for the entirety of this scene. The acting, the camera work, the lack of music, the distorting sounds, the reincorporation, the ad alarm, everything. Everything about this scene is perfect. Before moving on, let's quickly talk about the episode's themes. The overarching theme is that of giving up. The story is filled to the brim with characters that have given up in some way or another. First, the Asian girl. She likes Bing and tries to talk to him. However, Bing has no interest on her whatsoever. Or he's too dense to realize that she's interested. So she just gives up after one attempt. Then there's asshole guy, who probably gave up a long time ago. He's pretty much the model citizen for this type of society. A society of people who've given up. Then, Abby. When we first meet Abby, she's already given up. Her dream of becoming a singer is reignited by Bing, who gives her the ticket to compete in Hotshot. Now, here's where things get a little bit complicated. Abby drank a compliance before going on stage. We're led to believe that this is some kind of drug, which makes people more open to suggestion or something along those lines. And lastly, Bing. We kind of covered him already, so I'll keep it brief. When Bing gives up, it's pretty much a punch to the stomach. He's the main character, he's our hero. He's the last person you'd expect to give up. All the previous characters who gave up kind of fueled his speech and his stride for change. The fact that he gives up like everyone else leaves the viewer with a horrible sense of dread and depression. In the last shot of the episode, we see Bing staring down on a forest from his new, bigger box. This tiny 10 second scene is a complete game changer about what we assumed before. You know, that the world outside is apocalyptic and shit. However, Bing could also be staring at yet another screen. We don't really know. On one hand, that pretty much looks like a window in every possible sense, but if it is a window, why aren't they living outside? Why do they confine themselves to living in this box? I got a few theories about this, so hear me out. Theory number one. Humanity is just comfortable living this way and would rather stay in their boxes than go back outside. You know, Wally style. Theory number two. Every job that people could do has been replaced by machines. As far as we know, everyone is either a biker, a lemon, or a TV personality. So food, clothing, and other essentials are most likely made by machines, automatically. So if they went outside, there wouldn't be enough jobs for everyone. I think the only reason they got the cycling system going on is because with it, Everyone has a job, everyone has a purpose. Like, it would be impossible for the bike riding to actually, you know, power their entire building, I guess? You make very little electricity by just riding a bike. On top of that, they're watching TV while doing so, so most of the electricity they're supposedly making would go to the TV. So their society is probably powered by some other electricity source, and the cycling is just there to keep people busy. In conclusion, the creators made this ending to be intentionally ambiguous for us to decide. So if I had to choose, I'd choose that it's a window, because it fits in with the theme of the episode, the theme of laziness, the theme of giving up. Furthermore, believing that it's a window turns a bleak ending into an unbelievably depressing one, which is a common ground for most Black Mirror endings. When it comes to people's response to this episode, they seem to be mostly positive, but with a few complaints. Number one, the judges. More specifically, Judge Hope. 
People see him as being too similar to X Factor host Simon Cowell. I assume I wasn't bothered by this because I've never seen X Factor or <laughs> know who Simon Cowell is. Number two, the asshole guy. People see him as a caricature and way too on the nose. This one I honestly kinda get. But me personally, I found his character to be a lot of fun. To my defense, I really enjoy asshole characters in movies, TV shows, and YouTubers. And just like that, that concludes our second episode in Black Mirror. Tune in again next time uh, for our review of episode 3, The Entire History of You.